All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming to the AI Village. Uh, our next, next talk today is by Yisroel on automated injection and removal of medical evidence in CT and MRI scans. Could we have a big round of applause? Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, so this is my first DEF CON, and I'm very happy to be here. This is quite an experience. My name is Yisrael Amirsky. Thanks. <laughs> and um, I'm a uh, cybersecurity researcher at Ben Gurion University. And I'm going to talk about how uh, deep learning can be used, not just in the in domain of maybe you've heard of deep fakes before, where you know we, people have used deep learning to kind of do face swaps or create uh, clones of individuals and make them do things. So uh, in this case, we're actually going to take a look at deep fakes, but in the medical domain. And uh, what we're going to take a look at specifically is how an, an attacker could possibly uh, inject or remove medical evidence in CT scans and MRI scans. Okay, so a little bit of background. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, MRI and CT scanners are basically medical uh, equipment uh, that take 3D volumetric scans of your body, and they're used to diagnose various different uh, medical conditions. So for MRI scans, uh, we, they can be used to diagnose problems in your bones, in your joints, ligaments, cartilage, or any of your discs, and, and your brain as well. And CT scans are mostly used for diagnosing cancer, heart disease, appendicitis, trauma, and so on. And uh, in the U.S., in 2016 uh, alone, there was about 38 million MRI scans, almost 80 million CT scans, and those numbers keep on going up. And they're a very powerful and important uh, tool in the medical community to be able to diagnose uh, certain medical issues. So what's the vulnerability? There, first of all, uh, there's so many radiology networks that are exposed to the Internet, either intentionally or unintentionally. If you do a quick search on census.io, you find something like 10,000 of these different networks. And also, the healthcare industry in general has a poor uh, security track record, as we've seen in the past. And just one good example of that, just several months ago, McAfee researchers were able to get into one of these radiology networks, download a CT scan of a person's pelvis, and then make a 3D print of that. So the main reason for this, so there's, very, there's various different reasons, but uh, a lot of medical uh, Infra uh, infrastructure such as hospitals use a lot of legacy systems and uh, they don't don't pair so well with new technologies so they tend to use very like downgraded protocols as we'll we'll take a look at that in, in a few more moments <clears throat> so what's a threat so we're not, we're actually considering not just the case of somebody stealing your data and taking a look at your personal data but actually what happens if the attacker goes ahead and changes that data it's not just medical records like what your, your blood test results were, but actual scans, manipulating those scans to then affect your diagnosis. So why would an attacker want to do that? So there's a few different aspects. The first aspect is psychological, that he wants to cause some sort of traumatization or life change. So think of like a political leader. The attacker wants him to step down and rethink his life or uh, for, perform some sort of global ter terrorism. Uh, the monetary aspect, so maybe the attacker wants to sabotage or falsify through evidence, form a ransomware, or the more likely case, insurance fraud. So if the attacker gets his hands on his own scan and then injects some sort of small fracture in his spine or a small aneurysm, which is evidence which is very hard to refute through other, other tests, he can then claim some sort of life, quality of life insurance and get millions of dollars from that. And then the uh, physical aspect, uh, you know, the attacker wants to cause physical harm, right? I think the, those cases are pretty clear. So what's the general uh, approach? So let's take a look at how a CT scan is processed inside a hospital. So when you go into a CT scanner and it scans you, it takes basically these vertical slices, 2D images of your body. And those are stored in a format called DICOM format, a standard. And they're sent over the Ethernet network to this PAC server for a later viewing. And then the radiologist at some point in time will pull those scans, analyze them, write a report and then forward that to the uh, requesting doctor, whether it be an oncologist, neurologist, depending what they're taking a look at. And then, then that oncologist or neurologist, that doctor would then give you some sort of diagnosis. So the point of uh, entry here that is most effective for the attacker is somewhere between where the scan was made and where the, uh, before the radiologist gets to make his or her report. So this is a, a, a very basic topology of what the uh, network inside a hospital looks like. And so you see on the uh, left side, you have a bunch of different uh, scanning modalities. You have uh, 
uh, X-ray machines, CT scanners, uh, MRI scanners, and so on and so forth. These are all connected to, the, to uh, PCs called modality workstations, which more often than not are Windows XP machines. And uh, they, set, they capture the raw data from the scanners, convert them to this DICOM format, and send it over the network to the PAX server. Inside this, uh, this network, which is supposedly segregated, but not quite, uh, you have other kinds of uh, uh, devices. You have uh, radiology, uh, radiologist workstations reviewing those scans, various different administrative systems. And of course, it's uh, many times bridged over to the entire hospital's network so that uh, you know, uh, doc referring doctors can pull scans, take a look at them, and uh, make their own prognosis. So those hospital networks, of course, also have their own Wi-Fi connections. And uh, many times also, uh, the network itself is also connected to the internet. Uh, for you know, radiologists in other countries to perform off-hours viewing of those scans. And as you can see, there are many different kinds of attack vectors that result from this. Now, I, we have published a paper on ARCA if you want to take a look afterwards. To, it kind of goes into detail of all the different kinds of attack vectors. Uh, but uh, I'll just say in very high level, there are three general attack vectors. One is from the internet. The other is through uh, Wi-Fi access points. And then the other is via physical intrusion. But once the attacker is in, he can then plant some sort of malware, whether it be uh, on the modality workstation themselves or as a man-in-the-middle device or on the PAC server. But whether, wherever he places it, he has full control over all the scans going through the network. And it's very easy to pick out a very a specific individual because the DICOM format lists the, the patient's name and all his information. So he can automatically kind of find which scan he wants to tamper with. And then there's other locations where he has kind of like chance uh, of picking up the right scan, such as... Uh, point, deploying the malware inside the viewer itself. Okay, so let's get to the interesting part, uh, the deep fakery of it all. And uh, let's talk about how exactly can an attacker automate the process of injecting or removing medical evidence. And we're going to focus on uh, lung cancer and how an attacker can inject or remove lung cancer from a CT scan. So let's talk about training this model. So the first step in training a model, we need data. So what we're going to do is actually in our research, what we did is we went uh, to these free databases of CT scans you can get on online. And we found one with uh, lung cancer and we downloaded that database. And then we went through it and we had already all the annotations of where all the lung cancers are. Annotations meaning where you look X, Y, Z coordinates. And what we did is we extracted these cubes uh, surrounding those areas. Because what you wanted to do is you want to just have the neural network focus just on the area that's relevant. Because if you give it the entire scan, you're talking about you know, uh, almost a billion pixels, you're not going to be able to train a network that way, and it's going to train on so much information that's not relevant. So instead, we're going to just cut out these small cubes, the areas of interest, and build the data set of these cubes. So we take out these cubes, we perform some pre-processing steps, uh, histogram equalization, which helps all the features kind of pop out. It's kind of like contrasting and uh, standard normalization, zero one normalization. And then we get this uh, nice data set of these cubes of the cancer samples. And we perform some data augmentation because often we don't have that many samples, something like anywhere between 600 to 1,000 samples is very, very small. So we'll augment that by maybe changing some rotation, uh, shifting in different directions, adding a little bit of noise to augment that to a few thousand. And these cubes are about uh, 32 by 32 by 32 pixels. Okay, so now that we have our data set, we can now train our neural network. And the neural network that we use is this kind of uh, uh, autoencoder here. And it's a 3D autoencoder, so the inputs are three-dimensional. And uh, what we do is actually, before we put a, a sample through the network, we kind of mask the center. We kind of erase it with zeros. And then we pass it through the neural network. We ask the neural network basically to kind of predict what do you think is going to go inside this masked area. This process called inpainting is used to basically get the neural network to kind of guess what should be there based off the context of that blue area you see on the side. So that blue area acts as kind of like uh, this kind of tissue context where the, where the neural network can kind of figure out, okay, given the structure around, how can I complete this in a realistic way? And what happens if you train this neural network on many, many cancer samples, what's going to happen is no matter what cube you put in there, whether it's actually a cancer or not, once I erase the center and put it through again, it's going to try and complete that with cancer, and vice versa if I trained it on benign samples. So this process works decently, but what happens is that often the generated images are very blurry. Uh, so to improve that, we actually add another neural network, as some of you might already recognize this structure. 
uh, and this extra neural network is called the discriminator. And he's in charge of basically policing the outputs to make sure that they look realistic, that there's no blurriness, so to speak. And uh, so he's trained on samples that are actually real and samples which are, are fake generated from this neural network. And he has to decide which is real, which is fake. And during the training process, the generator gets the signal to try to learn what mistakes he had. Where did he, he foul up and make this some sort of artifact or blurriness so that he can fix it? So this general architecture is referred to as a... Uh, a uh, generative adversarial neural network. And the particular network we're looking at is a pix-to-pix -pix network uh, used for in-painting with, uh, with these 3D inputs and 3D filters. Okay, so now that we, uh, oh, one more point. So after we've trained it, we actually threw out the discriminator because all we're really interested in is the bottom half, that generator. Okay, so now that way we trained our generator, how do we actually deploy that in a malware? How would an attacker actually go about doing that? So there's a kind of like an attack pipeline, if you will. So once the malware kind of sees that a, a scan is going over the network, the right uh, DICOM tags for the particular patient, what it'll do is it will it'll use a simple algorithm to locate where it wants to uh, inject or remove uh, that evidence. And uh, it'll scale up that uh, cube to the right proportions because many scans are, are stored in different aspect ratios. Go through the whole pre-processing uh, process, zero out that center, use whichever neural network you want to uh, either inject or remove the evidence, and then reverse the whole pre-processing pre -processing step, add some noise, kind of cover up the interpolation blur, and then paste it right back in again. <clears throat> so you can, the algorithm could also repeat that multiple times. You want to uh, inject multiple different nodules in this case, and then eventually write it back into the uh, DICOM file. So here are some uh, sample uh, results. Uh, so this is cancer injection, and we're looking just at 2D slices here. So obviously they're 3D. So uh, the uh, left side is before, the right side is after. And uh, this is for removal. And you can see it does a pretty good job. And actually I have here a, a, a tool which you can play with. It will actually let you kind of inject and remove cancer as you go. So let's, let's look, give it a second here to start up. So uh, once you train the neural network, you don't need GPU to execute it. This actually can run on the CPU just fine. So here we go. So I've loaded up a, a, a full uh, a scan of somebody's lungs. And I'm just going to pause it. And if I click somewhere, the first time it takes a few seconds because it's got to load the model. But you can see just by clicking in different areas, you can just easily kind of inject cancer. <laughs> okay, if you, and also, uh, the same algorithm that we, so showed, that we looked at before can be used to remove cancer. So if I click over here and remove this horrifically ugly GUI and find a cancer. Oh, oh here's one. So there's a big one, so we had to click twice, but let's see if we can find another one. Here's another one. So as you can see, it works pretty good, and that's nice, right? But that's not good enough just to say that, oh, okay, so we can play around with neural networks, we can generate some content, but is it realistic enough, right? This is a 3D view. Let me skip ahead. So uh, this is also, by the way, this is with is just showing it doesn't just work with uh, lungs. It also works with all sorts of other conditions. So this is showing uh, reconstruction with brain tumors as well. Okay, so uh, can we fool the experts, right? So we've shown that how we can generate uh, uh, medical evidence and or remove medical evidence, but is it realistic enough? So this is how we evaluated our system. We took 100 CT scans. Uh, and uh, we split it up as follows. So 35 of them, we, uh, which were actually um, malign, they had cancer in them. Uh, we used the tool to remove all the cancer automatically. And then we took uh, 35 of them, which were actually clean uh, scans with the completely healthy. And we injected one or more uh, nodules to each uh, uh, of these scans. And then we also added in 30 untapered altogether just to, as a baseline. And then with this data set of 100 uh, tampered scans, uh, we uh, hired three expert radiologists uh, and uh, also 
got ourselves our own state-of-the-art uh, lung cancer screening AI, which was downloaded freely online, which won the CAGL 2017 uh, competition. And uh, the first uh, evaluation, we did a, bl a blind trial. So we didn't tell the radiologists anything about fishy about these scans. We just said, okay, go make, uh, you know, diagnose them. Tell us what you think. Uh, and then in the second trial, uh, we took the last 20 scans and uh, it was open. We told them, hey, listen, we tampered these scans. Can you tell the difference between a tampered scan and uh, an original scan? So for the blind test, uh, it was, the results were quite staggering. So about uh, we had a 99% attack success rate for removing cancer, 94% atta attack success rate, uh, sorry, for inject 99 for injecting, 94 for removing. And uh, we also asked the radiologists, we gave them a survey, asked them, what do you think about these cancers, the tampered ones? We didn't tell them they were tampered. And uh, they uh, gave us uh, pretty high scores in terms of how malign they are, how dangerous they are. For most cases, if not all, they required some sort of biopsy. And then uh, for the uh, open test, uh, where we reveal the, the truth, the uh, radiologist's accuracy was still very low, anywhere between 30 to 60% accuracy, which means that they weren't really able to differentiate between what is real uh, cancer and fake cancer. Okay, so we know that they're realistic. Um, and we know how an attacker can go about this attack, what the, entire, what the attack vector might be. Uh, but how can we validate that? So, you know, this is, sounds kind of sci-fi. Is it actually pr possible that an attacker can get into a hospital and manipulate those scans? So we decided, okay, so we have to take this one step further. Let's go do a covert penetration test on an actual hospital and see if we can get in there and deploy a man-in-the-middle device and tamper those scans. So this is how it went down. So we took a, a Raspberry Pi and we got uh, a, a, USB t, a USB to Ethernet adapter. We put them. Uh, we also printed out a small little Philips label so it looks legit. And uh, we put it all together and it looks something like this. And you get this kind of like uh, man in the middle of device that you can plug in between the CT scanner and the rest of the PAX network. And it would intercept everything, leaving no forensic evidence, make sure it left no traces. And uh, it would also act as a very nice uh, backdoor into the network because we have, from the waiting room, we can connect to its access point. So this is a, a short little video clip. And it's going to show you uh, basically this penetration test. So what I did basically is uh, I went to this hospital, and I, of course, with permission. Uh, but I didn't tell them I was coming. And I waited for the, for the cleaning staff to open the door, and uh, I just walked right in. And if you walk in like you belong there, no questions are asked. And uh, it took a few minutes, and eventually I was able to find uh, the radiologist workstations, so I can go ahead and plant my device there, but that wasn't the, the uh, prize. And uh, not so far away was the, uh, one of their CT scanning rooms, and there's the CT scanner. And once I found it, it took uh, no more than 30 seconds to unplug the Ethernet cable there, plug in my own little man middle device, and very conveniently put it under this floor panel here so nobody will find it. And that was it. I was able to intercept all the data. And as you'll see also, I was able to get a nice uh, strong Wi-Fi signal uh, from, uh, from the waiting room. You know, another interesting thing is that I learned a lot from this uh, penetration test. It wasn't just about you know, intercepting the scan, but I also found out that the internal security of many hospitals are actually very poor. They assume because it's segregated, somewhat segregated, that, uh, that they don't have to rely on so many uh, security protocols and they can be quite relaxed. So uh, after I showed them what, I, uh, what I've done, I got into the network, uh, they helped me perform a CT scan, and I was able to intercept that scan, and I found that not only was the scan sent over uh, uh, in, in clear text, it was supposedly uh, encrypted, but it was all in plain text, so I was able to manipulate the entire content. Uh, and uh, I found out also that after about something like three minutes, I was got 27 uh, credentials for doctors from that hospital just freely broadcasted over the network. Uh, because again, there's supposedly uh, you know no user except for internal users could use this network, but you know anybody with get, walks down down this hospital can see ports on the wall, you can just plug right in and get access. <clears throat> so after you know after this uh, we uh, we uh, went to the Washington Post and uh, made article and uh, through some uh, uh, excellent uh, journalism there 
they found that, uh, you know, this is actually the general case in many different hospitals in US and around Europe, that uh, hospitals in the internal network has very poor security. And the encryption uh, is typically not enabled uh, between the scanners in the network and the PAX server. So very briefly, some countermeasures. Uh, so there's a preventative, preventative uh, countermeasures. So uh, we can uh, try and secure the data in motion. Uh, at least, the very least, naval encryption on this network would uh, solve a lot of problems. Uh, but as I mentioned before, a lot of hospitals, even though they could technically enable encryption, that would cause a lot of different components to fail because they're using a lot of different legacy components. So this old x-ray machine that they're still using doesn't support the latest you know, protocol, so they'd rather just leave it all downgraded. Uh, another thing they could do is staff awareness. You know, if somebody walks in, they're not, they don't belong there, they should ask questions, not just ignore them. Uh, and there's also ways for detecting, right? So uh, actually in the DICOM uh, standard, you can actually enable a digital signatures and that, so that the CT scanner will actually put a digital signature and make sure, so you can verify that it hasn't been tampered. But unfortunately, pretty, as far as I know, nobody uses that. Uh, and uh, there's more advanced techniques such as watermarking and tam uh, image tamper detection, but all these, none of these methods are deployed on, on site as far as I know, uh, and there's a lot of ongoing research on this subject as well. So in summary, uh, with deep learning, it's possible to inject medical evidence into CT MRI scans uh, automatically and realistically, and the, Moodle, uh, the model can f uh, fool a state-of-the-art AI 100% of the time and expert radiologists between 96 and 99% of the time. Uh, and we, as we've seen, the attack is viable and uh, can also easily be, mi uh, be easily mitigated if uh, the healthcare uh, you know, industry uh, takes a few steps forward and tries to push through and uh, clean up their security hygiene. So uh, I think we, maybe we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question, and uh, if yeah. What level hardware do you need to run the AI to do the injection? Um, I mean, I'm running what you, that demo you saw here. I just ran on my laptop, so any decent CPU can do it. Uh, question, the question is really how quickly you want to execute it. And it takes, I think, uh, the model itself after trained was about 500 megabytes. The model, just the model. Yeah. Um, I find when I read a lot about like flows, you see a lot of uh, comparisons of like fractal geometry. And is it using the algorithms like, like that to sort of scale things up and down? Or is it the entire thing sort of empirical where you just went in and said, okay, so, uh, like like I said before, a lot, all these scans they're uh, they're saved in different aspect ratios. I think for compression reasons. Uh, so the neural network has to see everything in the right units, right? You can't give it one scan that's you know uh, half of the measurement of the previous scan because things just won't match up. So. Uh, we have to scale everything, and we just use simple interpolation, like you know Python uh, ND image interpolation, uh, and that causes some blurring, uh, which is why, as you saw, we also had to add some uh, added noise to kind of hide up those uh, sins. Uh, but that's all we did, really. Uh, the data set, uh, I think it was 800 scans total. We didn't use all of them because we only want the ones with cancer. And uh, the real data set is actually just how many nodules we extracted, which I think in total was something around um, 600 uh, before augmentation. Uh, and when, after augmentation, I think we got up to um, uh, probably around 16,000. Uh, and uh, even though there's they're, they're, you know, 32 by 32 by 32 cubes, that's still a lot of pixels. Uh, so it took about... Uh, 24 hours to 30 uh, hours to train the, ne the network. Yep. Okay, last question. Uh, it can happen all, on the network itself, on the go. So when the file is being sent from the uh, from the scanner to the PAC server, it's in clear text. So that the Raspberry Pi that I had, I just ca captured it, changed the pixels, and sent it along.
You don't have to do it as every single packet goes by because it just opens a TCP channel. So you just kind of pretend, you know, as a classic man of metal tech, just gobble up all the data, process it in your own time, take a minute or two, and then just pass it along. Yeah. Okay, so if anybody wants to come at the AI Unwind, uh, you can play with the, uh, the uh, little tool that I made and check it out and speak with me. All right, thank you.